I got a lot of uh, negative feedback last week for not starting with a story. So um, if you need a story, you should spend time with Guy Platter. That is a great way to get a story. And, uh, and uh, we took a short road trip with our wives to Ohio last night. Uh, along the way, he felt led to start a um, Jeepin' for Jesus chapter. <laughs> and uh, that's not a doctored photo. And uh, it didn't last long. By the way, Jeepin' for Jesus is a, uh, it was inspired by Wendell's uh, Pool Players to Parishioners program. I don't know if you know about that. So it's about the same thing. <clears throat> and um, it didn't last. We got to the restaurant in Ohio. Um, and somehow, the waitress came to believe that Guy and I were a couple, <laughs> and, um, which made Rachel and Deanna a couple. And um, because Guy told him we were a couple, <laughs> uh, that was the reason. And so I thought, rather than disgrace the Lord or the Jeeps, we would just dissolve it so <laughs> it does not exist anymore. So I love everything about that. That is awesome. Um, so we're continuing from last week. So this is kind of a sermon on Romans. We're continuing on from chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, to try to get a little bit more insight into foreknowledge, uh, God's um, predestination, divine predestination, but especially the last part, which was his call to his people and how they might respond in faith. And I think this is personally incredibly interesting, but even if this kind of thing isn't in your like top 10 idea of sermons, I hope we at least see the uh, <clears throat> value in looking at uh, difficult questions and looking into what Scripture says about them for ourselves um, and attempting to understand our faith better. That's, that's the main goal. And then, of course, these things affect how we think about God, fundamental understanding of God, our role in creation, and it, it affects other things as well. Um, <clears throat> Having said that, I'll report that it's important, I'll re repeat that it's very important to remember this is not a center circle issue. It's fine to have disagreements in a charitable way with uh, each other. Uh, and the believers that tend to debate this are those that hold a high view of scripture and they take biblical instruction seriously. Uh, and so that's where we land. So people have strong opinions about these things for sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, I don't know why this happens every time I come up here. I wanted to... <clears throat> clarify my comment last week about Steve's endorsement, which he was kind enough to give me. I was limiting, in, I was intending to limit his endorsement to the comments I was making on quoting people about Calvinism. Like, because, you know, sometimes when you quote people, you can quote them out of context, which is, of course, not what I wanted to do. Um, he was, in no way, endorsing my commentary on those things or, or the other things I had to say. I would have thought that went without saying, but uh, maybe not. So I just wanted to make sure that was the case. Uh, but I do appreciate, you know, Steve has a great way of being candid, but also being charitable at the same time. He'll say what he means, and he has well-developed beliefs, and I, I highly respect him for that. But I think he's just a very good example of being charitable about these second circle issues. <clears throat> and one last thing I guess I would say about that is, if you really want to understand what, for example, a Calvinist or Arminian or somebody that holds a Lutheran position or something else, what that means in practice, you should read uh, a book uh, by a, a reputable author because really only somebody who lives that out and gets it and it clicks for them is really only, uh, they're the ones that able, are able to, in, in practice, represent that belief system well. And so, of course, it's good to be well read on all those things. So, we'll pick up from where we were last week. We covered, as I said, Romans 8, 29 to 30. I'll just read it one more time in case somebody's listening in and doesn't have it in front of them. <clears throat> the first thing we did was we went over what this means in its most basic sense. So I would also like to repeat that the, the clearest teachings in here are also the mo most important. Not everything in here is a second circle issue. There's plenty of good uh, other things. So beginning in verse 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And obviously there's a lot going on here. Um, but the, the key components are certainly all that God has done in his omniscience, his power, and his sovereignty. Um, all of this then is done for love out of his people. So wherever the discussion goes, we want to never lose sight of those main thoughts. 
um, in discussing different views on the nature of divine foreknowledge, predestination, and God's call. There were some distinct points of contrast, obviously, between the two perspectives we looked at. So to summarize real quick, the Reformed or Calvinist view says God predestines individuals to faith, and his foreknowledge is solely a matter of what he plans to carry out, and these are known as God's decrees. From the Arminian perspective, God predestines those who have faith, meaning his foreknowledge anticipates the free choices of his creatures. These also, uh, sorry, this also understands God as predestining the church corporately, which are those who are now in Christ. But since predestination is not something we can actually relate to personally, and it's uh, actually a fairly rare word in the New Testament, I posed instead a hopefully more accessible question for us to look into today. Are we called to exercise faith to be born again, or must we be born again in order to have faith? Uh, and scripture has a lot to say, of course, about faith and belief, and the more passages we have to look at, the better, it seems. And while we'll reference Romans a lot, uh, like I said, this isn't technically a sermon on Romans. I'm supposed to apologize for that normally here, I guess. Uh, but a wider view uh, on this topic, drawing from additional passages, which I think will be very helpful for us. Um, and while it would seem clear that God's call in our response and faith must involve some sort of simultaneous interaction. Uh, what the question here is really getting at is uh, whether being born again or regenerated is a necessary prerequisite to uh, exercising faith. That's, that's the key difference. Must that happen first before exercising faith? In Reformed theology, um, God, God's call, remember, is effectual since man is spiritually dead he cannot respond in faith unless he or she is first given life. That's a key thing to remember. When God extends a saving, irresistible grace, it results in regeneration, at which point the, pers can the person can and will respond positively in faith. Arminian teaching understands God's call as an invitation, which is not limited and is extended to all by means of a pervenient or enabling grace, People are given the ability to respond and are even drawn towards God, but not inevitably compelled. This grace is the divine work of the Word or the Spirit uh, that, initiates, uh, that initiates among humanity to give what is needed or lacking so that men and women are then able to receive new spiritual life. So we'll first look at some passages on faith and belief that each see as supporting their perspective. Then we'll just wrap up by looking at how each understands the, really what's the foundational doctrine behind this, which is called total depravity. And that includes limitations on what we would call man's spiritual ability. Um, and it would seem that directly quoting passages to support one's view on how faith works would be the most promising approach, but this is not uh, actually always quite as simple or as fruitful as we might expect. Uh, consider Colossians 2.12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. John Piper, reformed pastor and writer, says about this, it's like saying I was buried after a cave-in in the mine and I got out through a tunnel. But that statement, I got out through a tunnel, doesn't tell you who built the tunnel. Did I dig it or did somebody else dig it for me? None of that is addressed in this verse. And I think he is completely right. I uh, think this is very well said. Probably most passages, or at least many, that discuss a saving faith aren't teaching how faith works, but first of all, that it's necessary to exercise faith or belief. And then secondly, when faith or belief is practiced, it is always efficacious due to Christ's sacrifice. But Piper goes on to say, I don't think there's a single verse, a single passage in the Bible that teaches that faith causes or brings about regeneration or new birth, but I think there are many texts that teach that new birth precedes and brings about faith, and that's the crux of the matter. So that quote seemed to fit really well, what we're talking about this morning. Um, a spontaneous example of this came up for me last week when I was talking to a pastor who believed that a Reformed view of John 10 was the obvious and the only understanding. Uh, verses 24 to 27 say, the Jews who were gathered around him said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. 
Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. So due to the word because there in verse 26, uh, you could see that it's reasonable and maybe even a natural reading to see into it something like God knows who his sheep are, and therefore this leads or causes belief or, or the opposite of that statement. Um, the question is, must this be the correct reading? Um, so here's an example. Suppose I warn one of my students, uh, you're going to get teased a lot because you're a freshman. Being a freshman is what is, of course, going to get them teased, and rightly so. Uh, it causes it, right? But, and it's not necessarily true the other way around. You don't become a freshman because you're getting teased. That doesn't really make any sense. But then the student says to me, what do you mean I'm a freshman? Because this is a middle schooler. They might not know what that even means. And so I say, well, you're a freshman because you're in the ninth grade. Using because this way, I'm drawing an equivalence between the two that one is, in fact, the same as the other. <clears throat> so in the passage here, the equivalence would be between those who do not believe and those who are not his sheep. And the point is, if this reading is at least possible, we can't insist that this verse teaches people are determined or predetermined to believe. Um, and I think this is exactly what Piper is getting at in his tunnel illustration. He's warning us against too quickly limiting the meaning of a passage to what we are inclined to think what it says. So we're just going to look at a couple more passages on this side of things that are commonly used to support the reform view. Uh, for, for full context, I took these from an interview that John Piper posted on his website, Desiring God, so you can look those up anytime you want. Um, first, and probably the most referenced, uh, Josh actually addressed this not too long ago in a Christological reading, did an excellent job on that, but I'm going to assume not everybody remembers what he said exactly, so we're going we're gonna to tackle this one. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, the gift of God, not by works, so that no one may boast. Um, and often this is quoted and left without explanation, because to some it seems so clear that Paul just said, faith isn't from yourselves, it's from God. And you can see why somebody would walk away with that impression. I think that's actually pretty reasonable. Um, but... What we usually do with pronouns like this and it is we look at the thing that was most recently said, even though we know it doesn't actually always work that way. When Paul says, this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, what else could it apply to here? If we go back further, right, we see, okay, sorry, this might be the natural reading through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. But he mentions other things such as grace. <clears throat> um, in the Greek, the word for faith has a feminine gender, and the word for it, as in the, it is the gift of God, is neuter, which means it cannot be modifying the phrase that Paul inserted about faith. Uh, and this might sound really technical, but it isn't. Um, it would look something like this. If I said, I want to live in that house with Deanna, but it's not mine, you either have to understand English very poorly or women or uh, not know that I'm married to her. I don't know. There could be a lot of misunderstandings there. <clears throat> and so we have kind of the same thing here where we insert phrases. And of course, we have to be careful because that can lead to misunderstandings. So in this case, it would look something like this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this salvation by grace is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God and so on. Um, and the thing is, this understanding actually fits the context much better, because if you go back and read verses 4 and 5, Paul is saying, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by faith you've been saved. He's already said this, and so this is clearly what he's discussing and teaching on. So Paul's additional comment about faith in verse 8 it's fitting, it's important, it's an essential reminder, but it is not the focus of his teaching here. Um, which then, what I think people don't like about this, this leaves faith unexplained as to how it works, but that's okay, which is Piper's point again. And this just seems to happen a lot. One more passage. I'm going to kind of work my way around this. I'm just going to start with how, how Piper addresses this, starting with John 1, verse 12 says, to all who did receive Christ, 
who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Piper says the key to understanding verse 12 is actually in verse 13, where Paul explains, quote, quoting Piper here, explains what he just said, how that believing came about. Verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Then Piper continues, in other words, the new birth, which he wants to underline several ways, did not come about from the powers of flesh or from human willing. It came about from God. Okay? And so we can see the, the, um, the sense why there might be an issue with this. But the thing is, with what Piper just said, I hope we would all agree with him. I'm going to say what he said again. Uh, new birth did not come about from the powers of the flesh, nor from human willing. And, and I think we can definitely all agree with him. Anyone who claims that salvation would come about by the power of the flesh or from man would certainly be in grave error. In fact, this sounds a lot like the passage we were just looking at in Ephesians, where Paul says this salvation is not of yourselves. So what's the concern here? Well, on the reform view, to be born is to be regenerated, as we've discussed, being given new life from God so that a person can then respond in faith. This is part of the golden chain we talked about last week in uh, Romans 8, 29 to 30, all the way from what they call foreordination through glorification. It is all and only an act of God. And that, that is, again, critical to understand. In light of this, we can see how Paul's phrasing, the powers of the flesh nor of human willing, might kind of spark this visceral reaction since man can play no part in coming to Christ. But two points on that. First, Arminians agree that sinful man could not have brought about his or her own new life. God not only initiated the sacrifice for our sins, but he then extended this offer of salvation completely of his own will to mankind through an enabling grace. Paul then makes it clear, like in Romans 4 or Ephesians 2 and elsewhere, that our response in faith is not a work or a contribution that we can take credit for. So the concern here then is that man's exercising libertarian free will, does that go against what's being taught here? The Arminian sees no issue since his limited free will is already a gift from God. And central to understanding this is that being given the opportunity to accept a gift in no way implies the recipient caused it to happen or merited the gift in any way. And then secondly, uh, returning to the passage, as you can see, I was going there with this. <laughs> if we include verse 11 in the reading, the purpose of the apostles' contrast seems to get much clearer. And I'll say seems because I'm biased. Um, verse 11, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. This is Israel, of course. The children of Abraham. But to all who did receive him and who believed his name, he gave the right to become children of God, even though they are not necessarily descendants of Abraham. Many, of course, were not. Who were born not of blood or of the will of flesh nor the will of man, but of God. So the emphasis seems clear that God's new covenant is not based on bloodlines and human descent, but it's a, a spiritual family, uh, a family based on faith. Returning to Piper's tunnel analogy one last time, why might it be that the mechanics of faith aren't seemingly more clearly articulated in Scripture? Well, one reason that's common is to say, well, it's beyond our limited understanding, and there's obviously a very good chance that that plays a part in this. <clears throat> but it also seems reasonable that because what it means to have faith or to believe is a well-understood concept, and it uses ordinary language. So it would be unnecessary, if not redundant, to keep explaining it. Like if I ask someone to obey me, I don't then follow through with Johnny and say, that means go do what I said. He'd be like really annoyed with me. I was, well, he's annoyed with me anyway because I'm asking him to obey. But um, the definition of belief, not stretched out of shape or any just standard definition of belief, and acceptance that a statement is true or something exists, or trust, faith, or confidence in someone or something. It'd be like saying, here's the evidence. What do you think? What do you say about it? So some Arminian passages, among passages that are often used to defend the Arminian perspective, uh, we'll look at how the Bible just repeatedly, again and again, I'm being redundant, uh, uses faith and belief in conjunction with salvation. And what I think is particularly noteworthy about these passages is, one, there is so many of them. And then, uh, even though we can only look at a few, 
and secondly, they're, they're rather uncomplicated and won't require much of any explanation by me, which is great. So starting with Romans 10, 8 through 10, but what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And verse 9 is especially noteworthy due to the propositional statement, if you believe, the word then is sort of implied there, you will be saved. <clears throat> this, of course, isn't suggesting that uttering these words is some kind of a formula or a magic spell you could say to bring about salvation in a disingenuous way, but it is stated otherwise without any qualifications. Qualification. The Arminian would argue what's conspicuously absent Absent in any men is any mention, sorry, of some sort of behind-the-scenes faith that is being generated or mustered up by God. The language of belief in Romans 4 and elsewhere is one of being convinced, starting in verse 21, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words that was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us. Who, to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Similarly, we have the uh, so-called uh, Doubting Thomas episode in John 20. It's a little longer, so I won't put it all up here. It goes from verses uh, 24 to 31. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the marks of his nails, and place my finger in the marks of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were in sight again, and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? The implied answer is yes. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The point is Jesus did not disparage evidence to, gen to support sorry, genuine belief. In fact, he expects it. In Mark 16, his presumption even goes so far as to expect people to believe secondhand evidence, starting in verse 14. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said, go into all the world and proclaim the message to the whole creation, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So we see this elsewhere in Jesus' ministry. We don't have time for many of these. Uh, time and again, we see this demonstrated with the crowds and then especially to the religious leaders. He demonstrates who he was. He expected them to respond, and he rebuked them when they didn't. Uh, for example, John chapter 9, a, a, a tiny bit longer, 35 to 41. Jesus heard that they, and this would have been the Pharisees, cast him out. Remember, that was the man that was born blind, and there's, there's a whole episode in there that's very interesting, which we don't have time to read. And having found him, he said, do you, Jesus speaking to the man who was previously blind, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Uh, Jesus said, for judgment, I, so, okay. for judgment I came into the, this world that those who do not um, may see and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and he said to them, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. And there are many other episodes like this, of course, throughout the Gospels. This is one of the reasons I think some people struggle to understand Calvinism. If Jesus knows that people cannot or will not, maybe a better word, accept salvation in response to his miraculous signs and his teachings, unless they're chosen by God, then Jesus' pleading and especially his frustration with them become very difficult to understand. <clears throat> 
Uh, Acts 16, the jailer asks Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Sorry, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, right? That's this, that's, you do, it's, it's kind of that simple to understand. And you will be saved, you and your household. And to not leave out, I'm just going to mention a couple from the Old Testament, because obviously we don't have much time for, for, uh, to be extensive here. Psalm 95, today, if you'd only hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did in that day at Massah in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me. They tried me, though they had seen what I did. So they were without excuse. Hosea 4, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. And then Isaiah 45, turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So while Arminians would argue these passages and others like it are very compelling, probably sufficiently compelling, there are still other types of passages. One kind is not merely our response when confronted with spiritual truth, but that of us actively seeking God ourselves, as we see in Acts 17, verse 26. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. And then Paul explains God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. And a similar passage uh, that has this ring to it is in Hebrews 11. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And some intriguing verses about what God desires. We don't want to skip over these. 1 Timothy chapter 2. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. And then 2 Peter 3, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he's patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but that all should reach repentance. Our arguments, to be fair, against the using such passages in this sort of plain sense tend to be based on how God's desire and what actually happens need not be the same thing, which gets into distinctions between God's will, what he decrees versus his permissive will. Uh, and lastly, there is a very large class of verses uh, in the hundreds, I believe, that addresses God's call to salvation as unlimited. This would be words like all. He addresses it to everyone or whoever or the whole world. And uh, just to name a couple here to wrap up this, this section here, John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people unto myself. And I use this as an opening example, since in some cases, phrases like all people definitely could be an idiom to mean all nations in which the point isn't to address all individuals. So we know there are definitely some valid exceptions to that, and we want to be clear about that. First John 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but for the sins of the whole world. And this is an especially interesting passage because if the atonement was intended for the ele only for the elect, which would be our sins, then the second part of this passage is difficult to understand under the assumption that we reject universalism, which, of course, we do, because Paul's talking about two groups here. And, of course, John 3.16. <clears throat> so the key to the Arminian view is that the natural reading of the Bible is that God calls all to belief in him or faith in him unqualified, which is, of course, amazing. John 3.16, we're familiar with this, but sometimes we don't get past John 3.16, so I just wanted to read a couple more here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes or puts his trust in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And then uh, continuing, I had read, we had read the couple verses before this in Romans 10. These are the following verses. And scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, who riches richly blesses all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the question then just comes out, can such a plain and plentiful use 
of the language of all and everyone or the whole world be shown in every case to be limited. And a main objection against this, in interpreting these verses so broadly, again goes back to the foundational concept of whether people have the ability to exercise belief to begin with. And that'll be our last concept here for today. Uh, on Calvinism, what ultimately prevents each person from responding to God's offer is the severity of their condition. Each person's inevitable refusal to believe is a moral or spiritual inability which we would call uh, total depravity. So everything we've discussed here is, again, ultimately affected by our understanding of uh, man's sinful condition. Both the Calvinist and the Arminian describe man as using the same phrase, totally depraved, but each means something different by it, as I hinted at a little bit last week. The main reason for the difference has to do with the limitations in man's spiritual ability. For example, Pelagius in the fourth century was condemned as a heretic for teaching that man's ability to obey God was not significantly damaged by the fall and that Adam did little more than to set a bad example for us. So what he taught was unbiblical because it over, overly elevated uh, the view, it had an overly elevated view of man's spiritual ability. So let me begin by repeating that Arminians and Calvinists do share a lot of common ground here. Not only do they agree in all these pas a lot of passages we've covered in Romans, all fall sh sin and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. <clears throat> Romans 5, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all people sinned. These are the core beliefs that we hold in agreement. Roger Olson, uh, I believe an Arminian, puts it this way, Calvinists and Arminians agree against Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism that the sinner's will is so depraved and bound to sin that it cannot positively respond to the gospel call without supernatural grace. But in Reformed thinking, this still falls short of describing man's true predicament. <clears throat> Historically, the first appearance of this view was seen when August, Augustine sorry, developed his doctrine of the bondage of the will, uh, largely but not completely in response to the Pelagian heresy. Uh, Augustine's description of persons after the fall, as I said last week, is that they are not able not to sin, which is to say humanity had lost their liberty of the will, fallen man sins out of necessity due to a corrupt nature. And then the way Calvin says it to draw the comparison between the two views, free will does not enable any man to perform good works unless he is assisted by grace. Indeed, the special grace which the elect alone receive through regeneration. For I stay not, this is strongly worded, for I stay not to consider the extravagance of those who say that grace is offered equally and promiscuously to all. So you can tell the difference in the wording there. On Calvinism, the total depravity of man means total spiritual inability. Since man is spiritually dead, again, he doesn't need help, he needs life. So that, that would make sense. By far the most common passage that uh, is addressed here is uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. There's the difference there. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it's by grace you've been saved. And no doubt, this is a powerful passage. We probably all, I would assume, we probably all heard people use the phrase, dead is dead. That, that's, that's a pretty common argument when using this. Um, again, no amount of assistance can bring a dead person to get better. They need regenerated. And this is certainly the crux of the matter in Reformed thinking. <clears throat> but is this passage meant to be understood this way, of course, is the response. So while we do advocate for the plain reading of passages when it makes the best sense, the seemingly insurmountable problem is that man's sinful condition in Scripture is not consistently expressed this way as dead. For example, spiritually blind. There's just, I'm just going to name a couple here. John 14, 17, Jesus was speaking of the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. 1 John 2, 11, 
But anyone who hates his brother or sister is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, but have been blinded by the darkness. 2 Corinthians 3, 4, uh, sorry, 4, 3 through 4. If the good news is preached, if the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. That's actually a key word we'll talk about, a key phrase we'll talk about in a second. Are perishing. Satan, who's the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. And we see yet another description here in Colossians 1. <clears throat> this includes you who were once far away from God, you were, who were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions, yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And this was precisely the teaching of the early church up till Augustine, that uh, to be spiritually dead meant separation from God. When Adam sinned, he did usher in death for all humanity. The Lord commanded him in Genesis 3, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So this is important to understand. The phrase, you shall surely die, is literally translated, dying you shall die. So this is a continuous state of death that begins with spiritual death and continues throughout life as a gradual degradation of the body and culminates in physical death. The immediate spiritual death Adam experienced in the garden resulted in separation from God. So in other words, in the same way we experience corruption of the physical body now with death waiting for all of us unless the Lord returns, our spirit awaits the same end unless God were to intervene. Interestingly, this is exactly what we find later in Ephesians 2, down in verses 12 and 13. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizen, citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, we can agree that spiritual death isn't just a rhetorical device to say sin is really serious, but in the same way, I think this is really important, we must not understate man's sinful condition. We, of course, must not overstate it. For some perspective, and I thought about doing like a, a slide of a continuum, but being a math guy, I couldn't exactly figure out what the independent and dependent axes were supposed to imply here, so I'm just going to use words instead, and that probably will serve my purpose better. Since we've been so focused on these two views, there are others. It's worth mentioning that there are Christians, for example, who believe that God extends what's called a provisional grace. They reject the mainstream Arminian idea that a divine enabling grace is even necessary for men and women to come to saving belief. Um, Leighton Flowers, here's a quote from him. I do not believe that the fall caused all men to lose the capacity to respond willingly to God's appeal to be reconciled from the fall. Because God initiates by sending revelation, by sending light, by sending his Son. He sends the Holy Spirit to bring conviction to the world, and God works through human means. All the means God uses are sufficient to do what the Bible says they're meant to do. So, <clears throat> on this view, God's provisional grace is seen in things like the offer of the gospel, being a rational proposition that people can accept and understand, and then making himself, his presence known like in Romans 1, remember where we read in 119, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. So, and I only point this out to show that how classical Ar Arminianism, the position is actually a lot more reformed and closer to Calvinism than a lot of people realize because there are other takes on this. So I just have one last thought I just wanted to leave you with here that we don't have time to address, but I think is, is pretty interesting. Both groups agree that sin affects and corrupts every area of life. That's what total depravity means. Nothing is left unaffected or undamaged. But at the same time, it's really quite something that both groups agree, first of all, that man is not as corrupt as he could be. He is not utterly depraved. Like, we're, we're, all, we're all not murdered, for example. Like, so there you go. We're not as bad as we could be. <clears throat> and secondly, every person both sides believe, will be held morally responsible. So these, I think, add considerable support to the reasonableness of the idea that all people have the ability 
<clears throat> because it's been given to them to exercise moral and spiritual ability. In fact, I would argue this is self-evident much in the same way that the fact that we're sinful is self-evident. Uh, we see pagans adopting children, obeying the law, giving money to the poor. <clears throat> and in today's culture, they're usually thought of as the compassionate ones somehow. Um, all parents expect their children to obey, at least sometimes, and will use the phrase liberally, you ought to, you ought to do this, you ought to do that. And that's the thrust of the moral argument. People are on some level aware of objective moral values and duties, and most people agree that these even apply to them. And surely this is why Paul says in Romans that God will hold all people accountable for their deeds, every deed. Our, sovereign, our sovereignly limited free will is precisely what burdens us with the obligation to exercise it, however imperfectly, based on the light we've been given. Um, and I think this is what most people believe it means for God to be just. It means he doesn't wink at sin, nor does he condemn without cause. So I thought it'd be good to close on this quote. Um, it's a quote of unity. This is something Charles Spurgeon said, in, who's a, a, reformer, a reformed theologian, in a response to one of John Wesley's uh, sermons, because he is not. Yet the old Arminian standard said the same. True, they affirm that God has given grace to every man, but they do not dispute the fact that apart from that grace, there was no ability in man to do that which was good in his own salvation. Thank you.